here? Okay. After that uh, wonderful praise time, I hardly want to go into the news. It's so depressing. But we've got to go into the news. Somebody say amen. All right, so let me tell you a little bit what's going on in the world this week. Again, if you're here for the first time, you know that. And by the way, if you are here for the first time, would you just raise your hand? Do we have any first-time visitors? All right, we're all homegrown, right? So uh, you know what we're doing. Let me tell you a little bit about the uh, New World Order, what's happening. Europe's fading cosmopolitan dream. I've been telling you about the EEC, which is used to be the econo European Economic Community, which is now the, the Eurozone, if you would. We know that the uh, European Union has, has merged into that. The common market used to be called also. And so that's that 10-nation confederacy that we actually believe is going to happen, centered in the revived Roman Empire. Uh, it's also called Mystery Babylon. Well, we know that the only one that's, that's even capable of fulfilling that prophecy would be the European Union. Again, they're right now at 27 nations. Uh, we have a Brexit, we have, it, we have England coming out. It's quite possible that others either will come out or the bloc will start to get a little smaller with larger areas. So they're facing some problems. Uh, the continent and its cities are beginning to rethink their multicultural enthusiasm. In headier days, Europe's leaders dreamed of a multicultural continent. Its aging cities saved by millions of new immigrants eager to join a stable, prosperous urbanity. This was the promise behind the UK Prime Minister Tony Blair's Cool Britannia and the early enthusiasm that greeted Germany's refugees and their influx in uh, 2015, estimated now at about two million people. Uh, that dream, though, has faded, with Europeans now opposing new immigration. They're opposing it all over Europe. Once peaceful German and, Sw and Swedish cities have, been a spike, have had spikes in crime, a resurgence of anti-Semitism, and growing political unrest, all associated with the percentage, uh, with the uh, 59, with the percentage of Europeans uh, that have, that have uh, balked at the fact that they have more immigrants coming in. Almost 59% of Europeans thought the immigrants imposed a burden on their countries. In addition, uh, less than a third believe immigration has improved their country, with 63% of Greeks and 53% of Italians, respectively, stating that immigrants have made things worse in their economically challenged countries. Uh, multiculturalism has developed into an answer has devolved from an answer to Europe's social problems to a fraught reality of fragmented societies, alienated minorities, and resentful cities. So, uh, citizens. So what's happening is now we have, uh, we have a lot of the heads, the talking heads, the elites of Europe saying that they want to they pare down Europe. They want to get some big block nations. They want to take away some borders and uh, basically have an independent type of Europe. That would be the way where they can amalgamate all those citizens in there and bring everyone together because they're having trouble with their citizens of individual countries and they need to do something pretty much uh, pretty soon. So it may definitely fit into what we know as that uh, 10 nation confederacy. Let me give you a little bit about this one. This, this is uh, Democrats. How many of you know who they are? <laughs> By the way, you should not know who they are. Did you know that? Yeah. You should not know who they are. They're novice. De they're novice in, in, uh, in uh, Congress. They should, they're neophytes. It's their first year. You never see a picture of any first year congressman ever. And so these have taken center stage. And uh, I'm not so sure it's good for the Democratic Party. And that's what this one says. Democrats let radicals, let radicals take the steering wheel. Um, so it's hardly surprising that Ron Dermer, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, and David Friedman, the American ambassador to Israel, are being made the scapegoats for the fiasco in which the Jewish state denied entry to two members of the U.S. Congress. So you know what's happened. You know that the one has, uh, has appealed so she can go there and see her grandmother. And so Israel denied her first, then they said okay, and then she rejected them saying okay. She's playing a cat and mouse game. It's a political game. She doesn't even know her grandmother, by the way. Uh, but basically, I loved what Friedman said, the ambassador for the United States and, uh, and Israel, or excuse me, yeah, Friedman for, the, uh, for Israel. He said, uh, well, it seems that your hatred for Israel is more than your love for your grandmother, since you didn't want to come. So that's caused a big fracas, and basically what's happening right now is the Democrats should be censoring these two, but they're not. What they're doing is they're letting them ride the, ride the rails. They're letting them go on with their, with their anti-Israeli rhetoric, and it's splitting the Democratic Party. Let me tell you why. Um, most Jews in America are Democratic. Whether you know that or not, that's, the, that's their party. And so they're watching their party disintegrate underneath their, underneath their eyes and their noses. And so uh, we, we see that the, uh, the more stoic uh, Democrats in, in Congress are not saying a single thing, and basically that's going to hurt them. It may actually have help catapult uh, President, uh, President Trump to a second term. So it says, the mere fact that the tour Tlaib and Omar were planning was organized by Mitva, a Palestinian group led by Hanan Haswari, and that is guilty of numerous acts of open anti-Semitic hate is far more worthy of investigation and censure than anything Dermer Friedman did or didn't do. They were actually going with somebody who was an anti-Semite who was responsible for some terrorist attacks. Uh, so it says this, 
But the willingness of the media and the Democrats to ignore Tlaib and Omar's involvement with a group whose anti-Semitism is more the equivalent to that of the neo-Nazis is a major aspect of the story that shouldn't be ignored. So the Democrats have some problems. It says, whatever you may think about the wisdom of the ban, the reaction to it from Democrats is all out of proportion to the offense given or the facts about the stars of this tawdry exercise in anti-Israeli agitation. And I also believe this. I think that these people, these two ladies, along with the whole squad, I think this is their only claim to fame. I think they're going to write it as much as they possibly can. As long as they don't get any backlash from their Democratic uh, constituents, they're going to write it because this is the only way they'll have any noteworthiness. And so basically they put their faces on the map because of their hatred for Israel and them standing up. So I definitely think it's going to back, backfire, though, when it comes to the election in 2020. Let me give you this one that's coming on. This is a Silicon Valley censorship in the coming global police state. You may want to hear this all the way out and just follow it. If you love freedom and liberty, recent actions from high tech companies should have you worried. We've been telling you this for a while. In pursuit of the profit, the mega companies of Silicon Valley have created products that invade user privacy and easily cater to the demands of totalitarian governments. So they're, they're hooking this to something, not just that, that uh, Alexa is listening to us, we'll talk to you about that in a moment, but also that governments can control the database that's there. So look at two of these things together. For example, Amazon's Alexa devices are a huge convenience for many people. But most users don't realize Alexa devices do more than listen. They record. Once you talk to an Alexa device, it records your voice and it stores the audio file on a remote server. Amazon uses this information to improve its recommendations. They want to sell you more stuff. And you know how that goes. You have an iPhone, you said something, you have an Alexa in your house, you said something about a product, and, sooner, and, and no sooner did you say it than on your iPhone there's, there's advertisements for that product. It's because they're listening and they're targeting you back. Says, but in process, Alexa devices record and store, again, everything you say. And uh, are you okay with others listening to your conversations? If not, then don't bring an Alexa device into your home. Unfortunately, Silicon Valley's questionable actions aren't reserved for product development. They've also become arbitrators of free speech. In June, YouTube said it would ban videos that promote or glorify racism and discrimination. The problem is, who decides what video has racism in it and discrimination? Well, they do. Uh, the, this includes banning videos most people would find despicable, such as those denying the Holocaust or the Sandy Hook Elementary shooting. But it also includes a number of videos people don't find objectionable. So where do you draw the line? Who determines what's racism and discrimination versus what's normal in political speech? Facebook, Twitter, and other social media platforms have taken similar actions to purge hate speech. But in an age where social media dominates public discourse, Access to these platforms is vital to get a message out. You know, we would not have the millions of, of viewers we have if they banned me. And basically, they can do that. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with, with speaking whatever way God wants me to speak. Somebody say amen. But if you had a business and if you, were, if you had an income coming from that, they can put you out of business in a heartbeat. So it says it's a threat to liberty. Um, most frightening actions these companies take is the willingness to appease authoritarian, authoritarian governments. For instance, in an attempt to gain access to a billion new users, Google worked on a censored government-approved version of its search engine for China. What did they do? They took anybody that wanted to be on Google that had anything against the Chinese government, which is communistic and oppressive, they put them off. They wouldn't give them a platform. So they're actually being used by the governments, the big governments, to be able to censor whatever they put on. A Chinese language users' accounts were, were, were barred if they, went any, if they said anything against the government. Uh, where, we're, where, are, where are we headed? We're living in a world where the largest tech firms have more power than any companies ever have had before. Since the police power of the government rules over the high-tech companies, it means we're headed into an era where governments will be more powerful than they've ever been, obviously. So if a government be, is able to sway Google and Twitter and Facebook and, and Netflix, if they're able to sway them, and they are, obviously, because there's case after case here that I'm not reading to you, then what happens when you have an antichrist that comes on the scene and wants to control the world. All he has to do is take over those companies. All he has to do is, and I'm not talking about taking him over physically, all he has to do is put pressure on them and basically they will do whatever his bidding is. So we're already watching it. They're already extremely liberal. How many of you figured that out? They're already banning conservatives. And so it's, a, it's just a very baby step for them today after the next step. The Bible says the time is coming when a global dictator will rule the world. That's Revelation 13:7. He'll succeed in everything he does. That's Daniel 8.24. His power will be so great, no one will be able to oppose him. Revelation 13.4. His control of the earth will be so complete, he'll regulate the purchase and sale of everything. That's Revelation 13.17. And maybe you need to think about Amazon.com when you think about that. Because basically, he'll be able to control that. How is it possible? For most of human history, it hasn't been possible. As 
this is being written, it's probably not still possible, but it's very, very feasible right now. Our technology is continuing to advance and it will be possible very, very soon. And a global dictator could hold such absolute power with the, with, uh, with the help of internet and advanced technologies. And as the world's greatest tech companies have so aptly demonstrated, they're more happy to work with oppressive governments than anyone else. As they develop even more powerful technologies, their work will set the stage for a global police state, which we know the one worldism will be. And by the way, that's more of a sign of the time in which, which we live. It's where you should and I should look up because Christ is coming back. Let me give you a little bit more about, the, about what's happening in the UN. The UN report urges people to eat less meat protect, to protect the climate. <laughs> the UN is really kind of messed up. It always has been messed up. And global, global climate change, is our climate changing? Is, there something, is, it, is it true that we are warming up? Believe me, it is true that we're warming up. But it's not because of mankind's carbon footprint. I'm not going to read this all to you, but the UN has issued a, issued a law, actually, uh, with high confidence, a report, excuse me, that diets that are more plant and grain based will not only help uh, mitigate carbon dioxide emissions, <coughs> excuse me, and lessen global temperature increase, but it'll also be healthier for mankind. Now they're telling us what we should eat. But let me just tell you, it, to me, it's blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you why. Because the whole idea of our globe warming, it's, have, it's done it before. We've had ice ages, we've had many. Uh, heat ages, our, our ocean temperature has been warmed about 0.5 degrees Celsius. So their concern is going to go up to 1.5. It probably will. But that has nothing to do with your carbon footprint. What that has to do with the big ball that's in the sky 93 million miles away. It's called the sun. Maybe somebody should start doing a little bit of research on it. The sun goes into what's called solar minimum and solar maximum. Solar maximum lasts 11 years. In that solar maximum, uh, we see that corona is pushing off a whole lot more from the surface of the sun, a whole lot more sunspots, which talks about an increase in their heat. It's a thermonuclear ball. It gets hot many times in a phases, 11 years. We know that because, and all they have to do is look at the locusts. Locusts, locusts will swarm every 11 years. They'll actually hatch somewhere in that spot too because of the sunspots. And so we know that the locusts are swarming. We, I've seen report after report on it. Minimum, solar minimum is coming in two years, uh, which means the sun is gonna get, kind of ratchet down a little bit. It may take a little bit for the world to have that effect uh, and cool it back down a little bit, but it happens all the time. And no one's talking about that. All they're talking about is what you eat. And by the way, there's more cows flatulating in, in America than there are people. So if anything's ruining it, it's the cows. And so it, it has nothing to do with it. This is about the sun. And I'm, it's really kind of, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of depressing for me to hear this over and over again. It's almost like we're stupid and we don't understand it. Listen, it doesn't matter how many people speak something, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. So maybe they just should take their binoculars and look at the sun a little bit. Let them think how, they can just stand out in front of the sun and see how warm it is. I mean, come on. So basically they're missing the whole point. Let's talk about Israel for a moment. This article says, will Israel launch a military ground operation in Gaza? It's beefing up in Israel. It's getting tight in Israel. There's lots of rockets that are coming in both to the north, which is the Golan Heights, and to the southwest, which is, which is Gaza, and where there's tunnels being done. And Israel knows about it. They have the Mossad and they have a lot of uh, agencies, spy agencies that know all about it. I think America doesn't know about it at all, but here's what's happening. Palestinian terrorists in the Gaza Strip again attacked Israel, and this time fighting, firing three rockets into the southern city of Sidorot over the weekend two of them being intercepted by the Iron Dome air defense system. Some Israelis are calling for a military ground invasion into Gaza to damage or even eradicate Hamas. Hamas is horrible for, for Gaza. It's har horrible for the Palestinians. According to the uh, Ephraim Inbar, president of the Jerusalem Institute of Strategy and Security, the government is certainly capable of conducting large-scale operations. This issue is not of capabilities but of political will, he told the Jerusalem News. So what's happening here is we have Netanyahu who will definitely do something, but he's kind of holding back a little bit because of politics. And so they're kind of urging him to do something. Some are. Others are saying, no, you don't need to capitulate. You need to be able to stay strong. Some are saying, yes, you do need to capitulate. You need to be able to just work this out uh, in, a, in some type of agreement, which Hamas is not to any agreement. Let me show you the uh, pathos, what's happening there. So if you see Israel, and I've shown you this a couple times, Israel's right here. here. That's that little green area. These are aggressive Arab nations. Now, any one of those, those are, those are primarily anywhere from 92 to 98% Muslim in, those, in these. This is the only democracy in the Middle East, size of Connecticut. Israel is, a, is bordered by 22 hostile Arab Islamic nations that are 640 times her size. 640 times her size. 
and 65 times her population. Jewish population worldwide is 13 million. Only about eight to nine are living here, the rest are around the world. The Arab population worldwide is about 300 million and most of them live here. So when we're looking at Israel, we're looking at a lot of pro potential problems that will happen, which will bring me to this next chart. And I'll show you this. So where are the possible, possible things? Well, Lebanon has 70,000 rockets pointed at Israel right now. Not 7,000, 70,000. Uh, that's right up top in Lebanon. That's right over here. That's where Hezbollah has amassed uh, some, some type of potential invasion into the Golan Heights in Israel. Gaza, down over here, we know that they have also guided rockets that were, that were probably from uh, Iran, and we also know they have tunnels going in, so do they over here. The Sinai, we know that Islamic Jihad and other radical Islamics are in the Sinai looking to make some type of advance into the southern part of Israel. We talk about Syria, we know that Syria is also posed, their charter wants to take them out of, the, of existence, Israel. Uh, we know that the West Bank, which is right here, there's also a disarray in the West Bank. And then, of course, Iran, which is the uh, rogue nation in that area. They have 400 pounds of 20% uranium enriched, enriched uranium, 400 pounds. That means they can, if they continue to, to enrich it, they can put it on nuclear, uh, can put it on uh, missiles and they can far, fire them. Not to mention Russia, who just blew up a nuclear missile. Just it, two other scientists died from nuclear radiation because they had a nuclear tipped ICBM that they were testing. And so they've lied about it. They said there was no radiation, but we know the two scientists died of radiation, not the explosion. And so we see a whole lot of things happening in this area. And when you look at uh, prophecy, you will see it's all over prophecy. Gog and Magog, Tagarmar. It talks about Egypt. It talks about Persia, which is Iran. It talks about all those nations, and that's exactly what we're seeing in the news. So does Israel know about it? Absolutely. It's amazing to me that tiny little Israel has survived so far. Anybody know why? Do you know, anybody know the weapon of mass destruction they have? It's God. Everybody say God. God. How many of you know God's a weapon of mass destruction? Amen. There's nothing that you can make that's going to go against God. So it's pretty amazing to me to see this being played out. Let me tell you a little bit about the economy. So I'm going to ask this question. It's a rhetorical question. You may not want to answer it. Is America headed for a recession? Yes. America is headed for a recession. Let me tell you, that all the indicators say we're headed for a recession, but I'm going to write, read you two articles, one telling you about a recession, then the other one talking about the liberals who want one before, before Trump's out of office. So th that's the whole uh, caveat that I want to bring to you. So here's 11 reasons why experts believe the U.S. economy or U.S. economic crisis is imminent. And I agree with them. It says, the numbers are telling us that we have never been closer to the next recession than we are right now. The storm clouds that were gathering on the horizon are now directly above us. And suddenly the mainstream media is filled with stories about when the next recession will begin. And there's a reason why. It has nothing to do with whether a recession's coming or not. It has to do with politics. In fact, there's been so much chatter about this that even President Trump is talking about it. All over television, experts, quote unquote, are breathlessly speculating about the coming recession and when it will begin, as they are dispensing lots of advice on how people should prepare for it. So what are the indicators? One, last week the spread between U.S. two-year and 10-year yields turned negative for the very first time in 12 years, not to mention the reverse curve that's going on, the yield curve. So we know that, uh, that every time that happened, last seven times it happened, we had a recession. And I explained what that was. Let me explain it one more time. If you, how many know what a certificate of deposit is? How many do not know what a certificate of deposit is? Okay, if you t somebody's, not, somebody's missing arms, guys, I saw like four go up. How many know what a certificate of deposit is? How many do not know? Okay, here's what it is. If I took $10,000 and I want to put in a six, year, six month certificate of deposit, arbitrarily, let's say I get, and you're not gonna get this, let's say I get 3% after that six months, I'll get 3% of my money. If I take that same amount of money and put it in a six year certificate of deposit, I'm gonna get not 3%, but I'm gonna get 12% because it's called present value of money. Your money's worth more now than it is long term. So they can give you more interest rate. When that yield switches, when you have, when you have the short term uh, interest rates higher than the long term interest rates, that's called a reverse yield curve. Every time that has happened, the last seven times it's happened in America, we've had a major recession. We've had that now for the last four months. So recession is coming. Let me go on. The U.S. consumer sentiment just fell to the lowest level that we've seen since 2019. 74% of econ economists surveyed by the National Association for Business and Economics believes that a recession will begin in the United States by 2021. Remember that number, that year. U.S. industrial production just slipped back to con uh, con uh, contraction territory. Number five, the IHS market manufacturing purchase managers index just fell to the lowest level that we've seen since September 2008. 
Number six, just like we witnessed in 2008, fear and volatility have returned to Wall Street in a major way. You've seen it. It's gone up. It's gone up 300 points. It's gone down 800 points. It's gone up 400 points. It's gone down 700 points. That's always an indicator that something bad is going to happen. By the way, let me throw another thing in. It's not here. Silver and gold are climbing up. Every time Wall Street is volatile, uh, silver and gold climbs up. Every time silver and gold climbs up, you'll see a recession coming because they're reacting negatively to the to Wall Street. Seven, the total number of bankruptcy filings in the United States has been steadily shooting up. It rose another 5% in July. Eight, major U.S. retailers continue to shut down more stores. Nine, on a year-to-year -year basis, U.S. freight shipment volume has now fallen for eight straight months in a row. Ten, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the probability that a recession will happen within the next 12 months is now the highest that it has been since the last financial crisis. Number 11, President Trump is suggesting that the Federal Reserve should cut interest rates by 100 basis points and that the Fed should start quantitative easing as soon as possible. That means they're going to start bringing their interest rates down so that basically there's more money flowing in the economy. We always do that when the economy is ready to go into recession. Let me give you another one on that. China is at a spot right now where we've been we'll be having the, these talks back and forth on trade, and that is also hurting us. So we're very, very close to recession. There's no question about that. But here's the next article. Political agenda behind media coverage of coming recession. So we know it's possible that it's going to come. We understand that. But the media has jumped on it because obviously they're going to use it against Trump because Trump has done so much for our economy already and our economy has been booming for a long, long time So here's, since he's been in office. All of a sudden, it seems like the mainstream media just can't ta stop talking about the coming recession. Um, and of course, it's true that there are signs of global economic trouble. And by the way, the globe is definitely going to ha have a recession. It's coming quicker to them. So we don't want to criticize the mainstream media when they actually decide to tell the truth because a recession is definitely coming. But could it be possible that there's also a hidden political agenda at work? The economy is generally regarded to be one of the bright spots in President Trump for President Trump and political operatives on the left clearly understand that it's a major economic turndown would spell almost certain doom for Trump's chance of winning in 2020. So what do you think they're doing? They're pouncing all over it. They're talking about the recession coming all over the place. Matter of fact, uh, Bill Maurer, which I don't like, uh, has said that uh, it, would, we, it would be great if the recession came right now. And uh, think about that. what that means. That means that everybody will be in, well, a lot of people will be in economic hardship in America. He said, I wish it would happen tomorrow so we don't have to elect Trump. That's horrible. That's exactly what the, what the, what the, elite, the uh, liberals are saying. They want the recession right now so that Trump cannot have a chance of being elected. And so they're using something that would hurt everyone. Can you imagine that? Uh, just so that they can have their way of not having Trump. So we, we know that there's article after article. They list all the articles. They list all the times they've talked about it. Uh, according to CNN poll from earlier this year, the performance of the economy is one of the main reasons for his current level of support. So that's why they're nailing it. They're going at it as much as they possibly can. By the way, it's not going to happen in this, in this media. It's not going to happen in 2020. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen in the end part of 2021. So basically, they're trying to accelerate it with all their news to get us to think it's going to happen so that people won't vote for Trump. I'll tell you what, more and more I hear about politics, the less and less I like it. I don't like politics at all. Uh, let me give you this one as we go a little bit further. This one uh, came out today. And obviously, I'd like to stop talking about this because it's all over the news and it shouldn't be. LGBTQ history cur curriculum will now be taught in Illinois. Illinois Governor J.B. Uh, Pritzker signed into law on Friday a bill that ensures the contributions of LGBTQ people are taught in public schools. House Bill 246 was introduced by Representative Anna Moeller to amend the school's code to add a more inclusive history curriculum. Quote, in public schools only, the teaching of history shall include a study of the roles and contributions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in the history of this country and this state, the bill states. You know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to see every every public school include in their history curriculum what Christians have done in America. There's a whole lot more Christians that have done things in America than LGBTQs have. And so if you don't include the Christians that were, that were unbelievable, like President Calvin Coolidge was an amazing Christian, and lots of pre presidents that were, if you don't include that, we're not talking about their Christianity. We're just, we're just not saying anything about it. Their Christianity and their views helped shape this, na this nation. We would not be where we were today, are today, without Christians who have led this country. So why don't we start our own bill? I'll write it, you vote for it. All right, I'll get on it right away. Here we go. So what we learn from public disavowals of Christianity, let's go under, under this. A disavowal is when you say, I, I really don't know if I'm a Christian or not. <clears throat> Last week, following the high profile falling away from faith of Joshua Harris, 
Former Hillsong singer and songwriter Marty Sampson posted this on Instagram. He said, time for some real talk. I'm genuinely losing my faith and it doesn't bother me. The next day he deleted a post and clarified that he hasn't fully renounced Christianity, at least not yet, like he's doing us a favor. Listen to this. Still, he admitted his faith was quite shaky. He then re uh, reiterated his doubts and said that the majority of a typical Christian's life is not spent considering these things. He goes on to say the things. He says one of the things is that how can God, and I've heard this so many times, how can God send people to hell? First of all, God doesn't send people to hell. Secondly, people choose that. Thirdly, uh, we know that the gospel is being preached all over the world. And fourthly, none of us are without excuse because the world was pared down to Noah, his wife, and his three sons and their wives, and they all knew about God. So somewhere down the line, some of their relatives decided not to know about God. And so then he says that uh, science is uh, uh, religion, Christianity is, is, and science oppose each other. That's still not true. Science does not oppose Christianity. They put their formulations out, and you give enough time, you'll find out that science actually comes around to Christianity. So he's saying, I don't know all these things. And he's kind of right. The reason why these high-profile Christians are losing their faith or giving up their faith is they have no apologetics. Let me tell you what that means. That means they go to church, and it's feelings. That's all it is. They sing songs, and they feel real happy. They hear messages about joy, and they hear messages about peace, and they hear messages about the things that make you feel good, and they hear all the ice cream messages, and they don't hear anything about sin and repentance and leading a life of service for God. They don't hear anything about that. And so basically, their feelings start to go in and out. If you do anything on feelings, it's going to be up and down. If you do something on truth, it's going to be solid. And so what's happened is this man who has written a catechism with songs, I mean, he's written songs that everybody sings all over the world, by the way, Christians, he's now saying he's not really sure about Christianity. The reason he's not is because, is because he can sing and get people all excited, but he doesn't know anything about the Bible. And I blame his church. Come on, are you with me? It's happening everywhere. It's happening all over the place. It's a very user-friendly condition. And you're, what you're doing, I've said this a long time ago. I said, you know, this American Christianity won't work in India. It doesn't work in India. It's not going to work there because in India, uh, there's a caste system. And the, and the Christians that are in India, they're eating out of gutters. And let me tell you something. When you tell them you can name it and claim it, you can have a real good time, they're, gonna, they're just trying to get by. I'm going to read an article to you tonight that I'm going to tell you. I want you to put, well, I want you to put an American church message against what's happening in this spot, and you'll see what I'm saying when I get there. So that, what I said all that to say this. You can fill a building up with thousands of people. They're like little flower petals. You can, you, can, you can play soft music, and you can play exciting music. You can spray a little perfume in it, and everybody will feel great. But as soon as a strong wind comes, those petals are going to blow straight away. And that's what's happening. America right now is under peace. Can you imagine how many churches are going to empty if we see something that, the, that their theology doesn't work, which is very, very thin to begin with? So uh, what we're learning is we're learning that their churches are really not doing the job. Let me give you a little bit more on your planet, and then I'll get to that last one I was telling you about. So earthquakes. Jesus said that there'll be earthquakes in diverse places. That word is different places, places that aren't normal. We know that the earth, that the earth is like a baseball. It has seams on it. There's zones, subduction zones. They, they go under each other. We have the land constantly going under each other. One of the big ones is the Cascadia subduction zone, which is in California. It keeps going under, and that's where the San Andreas Fault is. Where that happens, there's earthquakes that will come. We see that in the Pacific North Rim. We see the Ring of Fire. It's a subduction zone, the Pacific, the Pacific a subduction zone, under, going under. If a ship, let me give you an example, and I didn't want to give you this much information, but I will. If a ship goes down in the Pacific Ocean, and it goes down to the bottom, you would think it would stay there forever. It's going to disappear. Everything that goes down to the Pacific Ocean is going to travel towards the Mariana Trench. The Mariana Trench is a, is a subduction zone six miles down. It's going to go under, and it's going to be pushed under because that's the, it's constantly moving. And so what we're seeing is, yes, there's lots of earthquakes around the Ring of Fire, California, Aleutian Islands, Hawaii, uh, Japan. Uh, China, we have them down in Chile, down the western coast of, of America, down, uh, down the western coast of Mexico, but we don't have any serious ones in the center of America because there's no subduction zone there. The only little, little area there is the New Madrid fault line, which runs, through, which runs through Memphis and, by the way, Birmingham also. And so that's the only one we have, and so there's possibly get some quakes there. So just listen to this article. 
<coughs> Jesus said, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Matthew 24. What are we supposed to think when rather large earthquakes start happening in places that aren't supposed to have large earthquakes? 2019 has been quite a year for seismic activity already. And this article writer says, I understand that we should expect to see earthquakes in diverse places. But if someone told me that the U.S. was just hit by a significant quake, one of the last places I would think to check would be Kansas. The state of Kansas is certainly known for a lot of things. But earthquakes are not one of them. And that's why what we just witnessed this week is so startling. According to the Kansas City Star, one county in Can central Kansas alone has been hit by 11 quakes within the past five days. A county in central Kansas experienced a pretty shocking uptick in seismic activity last week. 11 earthquakes in five days. It started Wednesday morning, just two and a half miles southwest of Hutchinson, Kansas. There would be 10 more before the week ended. The biggest one of the group hit Friday morning, a 4.8. That's a pretty good sized quake. Uh, it says, and this particular earthquake was powerful enough to shake things off the shelves of people's homes. Uh, KWCH said people across Kansas felt this er earthquake. We've heard reports as far, from people as far away as Topeka. Further south, Oklahoma has experienced even more earthquakes than Kansas has over the past seven days. Overall, there's been a total of 65 earthquakes between the two states over the past week. Let me show it to you. So I pulled it up on a seismic monitor. Those red spots is where all the earthquakes are. Now the one by Tennessee is the New Madrid fault line. That always happens. But look at the conglomeration of them in Kansas and Oklahoma. That happened last week. That's called diverse places. Meanwhile, we're also seeing more unusual seismic activity out in the West Coast. In fact, the magnitude 6.4 earthquake just hit the Cascadian subduction zone just off the coast of Oregon. The, the uh, zone is a series of faults that run parallel to the coasts from North Carolina, Northern California, excuse me, to British Columbia is expected to produce a massive quake that would devastate the region if they're overdue. It is always alarming whether a quake rattles a Cascadian subduction zone because scientists tell us that someday a monster quake and a monster event will produce a giant tsunami that will wipe out coastal areas up and down the west coast. That means people up and down the west coast. Uh, we should be concerned about the California coastline right now. According to Earthquake Track, there have been 2,801 earthquakes of at least a magnitude 2.5 in the state of California within the past 30 days. But one day, the big one is going to hit. Life there will be instantly changed. Let me show you how it happens. So the subduction zone not only goes under, but it also goes north and south. So as it happens, it's like a friction, putting your hand against your other hand and pushing. And all of a sudden, it lets go. That's the quake. It says, of course, many Californians like to mock the idea that the big one is coming. But physicist Mikhail Keku recently told CBS News that it is actually way overdue. He says, we're playing Russian roulette with, the monster, with Mother Nature. Said physicist uh, Kekeu, CBS News reported. He said, you realize the last big earthquake to hit California, L.A. segment of the San Andreas Fault, was in 1680. Uh, according to the network, uh, that's over 300 years ago. But the cycle time for breaks and earthquakes on the San Andreas fault line is 130 years. So every 130 years, they should have a major quake. We haven't had one in there since the last 300 years. In fact, he insists the probability that it will happen within the next 20 years is absolutely 100%. Uh, the big one is inevitable. It's going to happen. It's the law of physics. For those living in Southern California, it's kind of living with a time bomb. But you can't actually see the timer. Sadly, one day time will run out and death toll will be absolutely catastrophic. Seismologists have repeatedly warned that us that San Andreas Fault is locked and loaded and it has the potential to unzip all at once. And when the day finally arrives, scientists have determined that the ground level will drop by at least eight feet. And that would result in the vast proportions of Southern California being suddenly covered by the Pacific Ocean. We live at a time when our planet is becoming increasingly unstable. And we are witnessing major earthquakes and enormous volcanic eruptions all over the globe on a daily basis now. About the coming California quake, the people living there have been warned over and over and over again, and they know the risks. But only 13% of all Californian homeowners actually have earthquake insurance. So when they lose their homes, they're really going to lose their homes. Our planet is rocking and rolling, and the warning signs are very clear. Let us hope for the best, but the truth is that Californians have already lived on borrowed time, and eventually there will be no more grace period. And that was written by a secular writer. Let me give you two last ones. You ready for some good news? Good news is I'm going to give you some good news. Here's the first one. Neuroscientist Shane Omar recently published the latest book in praise of walking. In the book, he delves into the most current brain research and what it has to say about the impact of exercise and walking on the brain and memory. In an interview, Dr. O'Mara noted our sensory systems work at their best when they're moving about the world. More specifically, it turns out that the brain systems that support learning, memory, and cognition, 
ability to remember, are the same ones that are negatively affected by stress and depression. Regular physical activity helps reduce stress and depression. Recent research shows that learning, the, learning and memory are positively impacted by spe, excuse me, specific brain waves that are boosted by walking and exercise. Physical exercise also increases chemicals in the brain that help make it new connections. These chemicals increase resilience to aging and damage caused by trauma and infection. So those of you that are worrying that you're about aging, don't leave right now and start walking around the church. Just listen. The Bible affirms that there's a benefit in exercise in this life in 1 Timothy. Of course, Jesus and his apostles traveled by foot all over the Holy Land. Let me tell you, Jesus was probably extremely fit, traveled over 200 miles just from the Galilee down to Jerusalem. So that's why when he was on the cross and when they would, when they would crucify people, they had to break their legs because they were so well, well fit. But the Bible says that uh, uh, God designed the body with physical needs, and the more the science learns, I told you science is not opposed to us, the more important we realize exercise is, not only for the body, but also for the brain. Okay, so here's the one I wanted to tell you about tonight. This is the good news. This is something that most people are not hearing, and we're not hearing it anywhere on the news. A special live watch gathering sheep among wolves. The eyes of the world are on Iran. But we invite you to look more closely, beyond the headlines and under the shadowed guise of the Iranian regime. Something is taking place in Iran that is both historic and unprecedented. More Iranians have come to faith in Jesus in the last 20 years than since the Islam first swept through Persia with the sword of Muhammad 1300 long and bloody years ago. The gospel runs far and wide across the Islamic Republic of Iran and takes deep root in the hearts of the disillusioned Iranian Muslims. Women who have met Jesus in chain-shattering encounters and then have led the charge to plunder every other Iranian woman from the oppression of Islam into the freedom and saving knowledge of Jesus. And why not? If you're a woman, I don't even know how you can embrace Islam. How could you do that? They are so oppressed, it's not even funny. And Jesus gives us freedom. Somebody say amen. The nameless and faceless members of the thriving body of Jesus in Iran, all the fruit of a rapidly reproducing discipleship movement, forming the fastest growing church in the world today. Let me repeat that. Iran has the fastest growing church in the world today. That should amaze you. Listen, I get chills thinking about it. And by the way, they don't own any buildings. They don't have any bank accounts. They don't have 501c3 status or denominational affiliates, and they can't worship in public. No soft feelings here. This is a hard area. They gotta worship behind closed doors. So they have, but they, what they do have is the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and the love for Jesus surpassing every daily threat of almost certain death at the hands of the Iranian regime. And for our Iranian brothers and sisters, that's enough. Is that not amazing to you? It's a precious moment in global history. It should show you what the true church is like. The true church is not fat. The true church is very lean. The true church knows about Christ and it knows about the teachings of Christ. Sometimes a blessing can be a curse. We've been blessed so much that we've been blessing ourselves right out of Christianity. So I'm excited about our Iranian brothers and sisters. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we ask the ushers to come forward. <coughs> and as they do come, <coughs> let me give you an announcement. Next, th next Thursday, we will have study, but all of you do not want to have a study on, on September 5th, so we're not going to have it. Because you all said you don't want one. No, it's, I can't be here, so we're not going to have a study on September 5th. <laughs> I'm just telling a fib. So there will be no study on September 5th. I have a conflict in my schedule, so we're not going to be able to do it September 5th. So next Thursday will be, as long as we hear it, this, next Thursday we do have study. Uh, so the next one after that, two weeks from now, September 5th, we will not have study. How many of you get it? All right. So don't show up on September 5th. Well, you can show up, but we're not going to have study. All right. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you again tonight. Thank you for, your, for everything you do for us, Lord God, for your mercies that are new every day. We're thankful today, Lord God, that we can come and praise you. We're thankful, Lord God, that we don't have to hide when we praise you. But I do realize that those, are hi those that are hiding and under persecution to praise you have to have such pure praise. Lord, we ask that you give that to us tonight too. That we have a pure praise, realizing that maybe our very, our very breaths could be taken away just because we know you. Let us get into that mindset and let us understand how precious it is for us to praise you. Receive it tonight, Lord God. Bless those who have given. In Jesus' name, amen.